Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's uh, Arrow Lecture. This is the 12th edition of the Arrow Lecture. Uh, I should tell you that, uh, I should tell you a little bit about the history. Uh, Eitan Shashinsky, who is uh, sitting here in the first row, uh, years back thought that it would be good to acknowledge the important role that the founding director of the summer school, Kenneth Arrow, played. And so we, uh, we, we set up uh, this annual lecture. Uh, Eitan also managed to find a donor, uh, William Ginsburg, a former Arrow student, to provide the initial funds. Uh, and uh, I think, at least, the uh, the lecture has been quite a success. Let, let me read you uh, the list of previous lecturers just to, to give you an idea. Uh, we started with uh, Hiro Uzawa, then Bengt Holmstrom, Partha Dasgupta, Danny Kahneman, Al Roth, Drew Fudenberg, Matt Jackson, Stephen Morris, Ariel Pekis, Jose Schenkman, Mark Mellitz, and this year, Mike Woodford. Uh, you probably, most of you, know a fair amount about Mike already. Uh, at, uh, he is uh, a, a principal organizer of this summer school. Uh, he was educated at Chicago, Yale, and MIT. He's taught at Chicago, Princeton, and Columbia, where he is now. Um, and you may know, you probably know, that before he got into uh, imprecise cognition, uh, where he's now a leading figure, uh, he did very important work in macroeconomics and monetary uh, economics. Uh, he, uh, <coughs> he's especially well known for uh, a book he wrote on the subject, uh, called interest and prices. Uh, but I, th I think it's fair to say that most of your work these days, uh, Mike, is, is on imprecise cognition. And we'll look forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to say about that this afternoon. So Mike Woodford. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. And um, it's a great pleasure to be invited to, um, to give this year's uh, air lecture. It's uh, uh, a great honor to do anything associated with the name of, 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 of Kenneth Arrow. Um, he was certainly a very uh, remarkable economist and intellectual in, in many ways. One of the things I always particularly appreciated about him was his degree of curiosity uh, and indeed, remarkable mastery of all sorts of subjects um, extending well beyond um, economics itself. And I think he played a very important role uh, earlier in his career as a founder of the Institute for Mathematical Studies in the Social Sciences at Stanford in arranging very important uh, dialogue between economic theorists and uh, uh, people outside of economics interested in the mathematical modeling of human behavior. And um, I would like to think at least that this year's summer school has uh, carried on uh, to some extent um, uh, that aspect of, uh, uh, of Ken's thinking in trying to arrange some cross-fertilization between economic theorists and uh, uh, people in psychology, neuroscience, and, and, and cognitive science who, as I hope, those of you who are the students in the school have seen uh, are in fact talking about many, uh, many closely related issues. In, um, in this talk, I want to talk about uh, imprecision in decision making and more specifically in about endogeneity of um, that degree of imprecision. Uh, to start with, I should probably make uh, concrete exactly in which aspect um, I'm interested in the imprecision of decision making. And I, I'm going to be talking here in particular about the apparent randomness 
um, of decisions that are made, and, and this is particularly clear in the case of um, laboratory experiments where one knows very precisely what the um, options available to people are and what they have been told um, about the characteristics of those options, and one still observes often an important degree of randomness in the choices that seem to be made. Uh, but saying that there's a random aspect in behavior doesn't mean that the randomness is completely unrelated uh, to the nature of the choice problems. One might, say, have a simple hypothesis that some fraction of the time people aren't paying attention and they do something unrelated to the decision problem, and that might the frequency of those lapses might be hypothesized to be unrelated to the problem they've been presented with. In fact, what one sees is random variation, but more random variation in responding to some questions than others, and in particular, it seems more random variation when that uh, randomness of the choice doesn't matter uh, very much to the decision maker. An illustration of this that I've already uh, talked about in a lecture earlier in the school, but then not all of you have seen. Uh, this is a, a classic illustration of that, a figure from a paper that Mosteller and Noji published in the journal Political Economy in 1951. What's being plotted here are the responses of a single experimental subject to a set of gambles they were presented with uh, in random order over the course of um, an, a single experimental session. And um, each of these gambles have the form. The subject has the option of paying five cents in order to take a gamble. They can do that or not. If they take the gamble, they'll get some amount x with probability one half. Otherwise, they'll get zero. The different gambles differ in the amount x, and that's what's being plotted on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis indicates the fraction of the time that the subject decided to take the gamble. So the notable thing about this experiment, unlike a lot of experiments in risk taking, is that exactly the same decision problem was presented multiple times to the same subject. So most of the gambles indicated in the figure here were presented 14 different times uh, over the course of the experiment. And what you see is they don't always, um, they, they don't always choose the same way. So when x was 10 cents, uh, Four times out of 14 they took it, 10 times out of 14 they didn't take it, and so on. Okay, so one sees the randomness, but the other thing I want to point out from the figure is that the degree of randomness isn't, uh, isn't the same. It's not consistent with a model where when they're paying attention, they have definite preferences about whether to take the gamble or not, but 10% of the time they don't pay attention, something like that. Um, you might observe less than, you know, probably greater than zero of taking any of the gambles, probably less than 100% of taking any of the gambles, and still a clear uh, discontinuous jump in that probability. That isn't what one sees. Instead, it seems that the greatest degree of randomness is, is when it's either 10 or 11 cents, uh, which one might think is around uh, certainly around the point identified as the indifference point by Mosteller and Noji, and if one thinks that makes sense, that somewhere between 10 and 11 cents, they in fact value the gamble the same as 5 cents with certainty, then it's when the gambles are closest to that indifference point that there's the most randomness of behavior. When they're a little further from it, there's still some degree of randomness of behavior, but not nearly as much, and when the gambles are even further from that, it's not obvious if if the behavior uh, is, is still random. So that suggests that um, um, we should be interested not just in modeling what people do when there isn't a lapse, when they aren't for some reason not paying attention to the question, but what they're doing all of the time, uh, including the variability of their behavior as the outcome of some kind of optimization problem, some adaptation of their decision rule to the kind of problems that they're being um, presented with. In saying that it's the outcome of an optimization problem, I'm not assuming that people necessarily consciously decide about being random. Maybe they're not even aware uh, that they are giving different answers to the same problem on different occasions, but I'm going to be interested in the hypothesis that this pattern of behavior, including its variability, is in fact uh, 
the result of some kind of adaptation process, and we might be interested in the hypothesis that it's well adapted uh, to the different problems that the decision maker is going to face on different occasions and the frequency with which uh, they face them. So we're going to be interested then in thinking about an optimization problem where this optimization is subject to some kind of limit on how precise the decision makers' decisions can be. And the question I want to talk about is how it might be make sense to specify the limits to precision so that we could see what they're doing as a solution to a constrained optimization problem. So the approach I want to mention first, which I think is probably the most familiar one um, to many of you already that's been used a lot in previous literature, would be to suppose that uh, the decision process does take into account the precise characteristics of the available options on each occasion, but that there's some cost of tailoring the decision maker's behavior more precisely to those incentives provided in the specific situation. And uh, a specific way of formalizing this idea uh, proposed by Stahl back in 1990 is the idea of positing uh, a cost of more precise control. Um, so we have some set of actions A in a given decision problem. We can suppose that there are some valuations of these different actions um, that are an input to the decision problem. I've written them here as U of A, and so the idea is that given the description of the available option A, uh, there is some well-defined value that is going to be consistently an input to the decision on every occasion when the decision maker has that thing in their choice set. But what the decision maker is going to do is not choose predictably a particular action, but instead the decision process is going to result in a probability distribution over the actions that are in the choice set on that occasion. And this set of probabilities are the solution to an optimization problem, the one written on the slide, which says um, there's going to be a probability distribution over actions selected that maximizes the sum of two terms. The first one is the one you would expect. Um, it's the expected value of this value of the action, which here is going to be the value of, say, taking a lottery. So the U of A is perhaps itself an expected utility if the way the lotteries are being valued is uh, in accordance with expected utility theory. We're averaging that over the actions that are taken as a result of this decision process that has a random outcome, but then the second term is proportional to the entropy of the response distribution. So this was Stahl's particular proposal for how to model the co cost of more precise control was by assuming that it's costly to choose a less entropic uh, distribution of actions in any given occasion, and so there's a parameter theta here multiplying the entropy, uh, so that's parameterizing the cost of control. And if one assumes that, then one can solve for what this <coughs> optimal probability distribution is, and you get this formula that uh, is probably familiar at this point uh, to the students uh, in, the, in this course. If it was not familiar with, you were not familiar with it before because it's come up several times, um, you have uh, a logistic function of those utilities determining the probabilities of choosing the different actions. And the parameter theta, you see, uh, enters there as determining how precisely the probabilities respond to differences in those utilities associated with the different actions. OK, so this, in fact, is a foundation for uh, the multinomial logit model of discrete choice that's used extensively in, uh, in, in the econometrics of discrete choice problems. Applying it to understanding the experiment that I was just showing you, um, it indicates why you could expect not just randomness, but the kind of curve that I showed you relating the probability of choosing the risky option to the payoff if you choose the risky option and the good outcome happens. Um, we would have two, uh, two cases, U of uh, the risky lottery, U of the certain choice in this case and um, you would get the prediction of the probability of choosing the risky lottery as um, a logistic function of the difference between those two utilities. If you thought that the utility of choosing the risky option was a linear function of the payoff, uh, 
um, in the lottery, then you would have exactly a logistic curve. If you think it's an increasing function but not, it could involve a small amount of nonlinearity, then it won't be exactly that logistic function, but it's still going to be a sigmoid function very similar uh, to what one saw. Another feature of this model is that it would indicate that that curve should cross the vertical axis at 0.5 as the probability of choosing the risky option exactly when the characteristic of the lottery is such that according to the subjective valuation of the decision maker, they're associating the same value with the risky lottery as with the certain amount of five cents. And that would explain what Mostella and Noji are doing here when they identify, ex they interpolate so as to figure out what uh, the lottery would have to be for that probability to be 50%. And they're calling that an indifference point. And indeed, under this kind of theory, you would indeed be evaluating what the terms of the lottery had to be for the subject to be indifferent um, between the two according to the valuation that is an input uh, to this process. Okay, so that might seem like a pretty attractive and simple solution to the puzzle posed by the experimental evidence I showed you. Something that is not entirely satisfactory about that as a, as a resolution of what's going on is it's going to imply that these probabilities of different responses should depend only on what the characteristics are of the choices offered in a given decision problem and not say what the distribution of other decision problems were that were offered during the same experimental session, right? If this decision maker has a well-defined valuation over different certain and uncertain amounts and it's just a function of the payoffs and the probabilities, then those probabilities in that formula should depend on what the certain amount was, what the characteristics of the lottery were on this trial and should be unrelated to the other choice problems presented during the session. Could I yeah, to, yeah. I'm going to show you some experimental evidence that challenges that view, but yeah, what's the, the, the question? How can you say anything significant at all about an experiment which involves 10 cents? Okay, even 1951 cents. I was around in 1951, yes. Uh, I was already an adult in 1951. And even in 1951, 10 cents was Modest. close to nothing. Okay, so how can you say anything significant at all? You could probably get an ice cream with it. Seventeen cents. Mm -hmm. So, so, so these are these are small amounts. But uh, I mean, the interesting thing is there does seem to be pretty systematic behavior, right? So, I mean, if the behavior just seemed uh, random and with having little. Uh, relation to what you were telling the subject the decision problem was, you might say it's because it's peanuts in all cases, and I offer you a little more peanuts or a little less peanuts, and I, I don't care about any of it, right? You might think I just get a cloud that's not correlated with anything, but instead, you know, th that, that figure looked pretty systematic, and indeed this specific mathematical formula I showed you, I could fit that formula, you know, to those, um, to those data points um, pretty clearly, and so I mean, to the extent that one does observe systematic behavior, I think there's 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 something to uh, to the understand. Systematic behavior is probably uh, giving the right answer, yes, uh, saying what one should do, yes, something like that. Not not really what the subject wants in terms of money. I think. I don't know. Well, but but it's responding it's responding to the incentive, so it's responding to something. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, you say it's the right answer. I don't think these are students who had taken a class that told them what they were supposed to say or something like that. So anyway, I want to show you a, 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 a fairly similar experiment. Uh, Carrie Freeman and Lawrence Jan have a paper last year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics where they do a very similar kind of experiment, again, choosing between a risky lottery and a certain outcome. The risky lottery has two outcomes. One of them is a non-zero outcome. Uh, the other one is zero. On all the different trials, the probability of the non-zero outcome is the same, but they do have different amounts of this X that you could get if you choose the risk risky lottery and it pays off, and different values of the certain alternative C on different trials, and they look at what people do and they present the same subject with the same, uh, the same choices multiple times, and so they can plot the probability of accepting the, the risky lottery as a function of the characteristics. 
of the two options. The difference here is that they also have two different experimental treatments in which the distributions that the values of X and C are drawn from are, are different. Uh, so they have a low volatility and a high volatility treatment. The probability P is always the same, and it's the same in the two treatments. But um, in one case, the values of X and C are drawn from two distributions that have lower variance. And in the other case, X and C are drawn from two distributions which have the same means, but the, uh, the standard deviation is doubled of, of both of those distributions. And so what you see here is that each of the two treatments, you get a curve similar to the one I showed in the previous figure. Uh, now uh, things are being lumped together according to what the difference in expected value between the lottery and the certain outcome are on the horizontal axis. But what you see is an increasing sort of sigmoid shaped curve in each case, but it's not the same curve in the two cases. So, when the, and these are the same distributions of values of X and C that are, um, that are being used in the cases that are included in the figure here. In one treatment, there were a lot uh, more values of X and C that were more extreme that were also part of the experiment. But here we're just looking at trials where exactly the same lotteries were presented under both treatments, and we see, uh, and we see different behavior. The model with the con optimization subject to a control cost that I showed you before wouldn't allow that to happen. So I want to talk about a different way of imagining that imprecision might be endogenized um, that, that can be consistent with this kind of finding. And this alternative approach is not going to assume that the only issue is it being costly to make your responses less random uh, in response to given incentives, but hypothesizing that the choice is based not on a precise recognition in the decision process of what the characteristics of the options were, but on some imprecise internal representation of the characteristics of the options. So the experimenter tells the subject the values of X and C, but perhaps then the decision circuit is having to respond to a retrieved value, which is um, some noisy um, representation in their head of what the amounts were that they were told. So thinking abstractly about what kind of theory this is going to be, we're going to suppose the features of a choice problem are specified by some vector, like in this case saying what the X is and what the C is. Uh, that boldface X in general will be a vector. There's going to be an action choice A. It's going to have to be based not on what the vector X was, but on some internal representation R, which itself could be a vector. Um, and that R, that internal representation, is a draw from some conditional distribution, conditional on what the true characteristics were that the subject was presented with. So we could hypothesize that you know, the decision rule is going to have to take this uh, internal representation R as an input, as the basis for the decision, we could hypothesize a decision rule that's optimal, that maximizes the expected value of the outcome to the decision maker, conditioning on R. So it would have to be averaging um, over different possible decision problems that might have resulted in you having that internal representation R. And even assuming that the decision rule is optimized for some probability distribution over possible decision problems, it's typically going to be the case that you'll observe the choice being random if you condition, and this is a typo on the slide, if you condition on X, on boldface X. So the true characteristics are boldface X. Conditional on that, choice will be random even when the decision rule is optimal. The decision rule, in general, will not be random as a function of boldface R, but boldface R is random conditioning on the true characteristics. Okay, so that's a way of uh, modeling random in randomness in subjects' responses. It's in fact a standard approach to understanding randomness in the judgments about perceptual magnitudes that subjects give in uh, psychophysical experiments. And this way of understanding things goes back to a modeling tradition introduced by Gustav Fechner uh, in his book back in uh, 1860. So in a theory um, like that, you can uh, model the structure of these perceptual errors as a result of, in fact, a constrained optimization problem. Uh, 
It can involve optimization in the sense that the decision rule, conditioning on this in noisy internal representation, can be a Bayes optimal decision rule. And so I'm going to talk about theories where I'm assuming that. And basically, Fechner already uh, was assuming that. He, he discussed models where the judgment made based on the noisy internal representation would be one that made sense, given, that it, uh, given the nature of the noisy internal representation. But I'm also going to talk about the possibility that the encoding rule itself could be optimized for some class of environments. And that's what's posited in what are called theories of efficient coding. Uh, people in the summer school have already heard some about that, particularly from Rava de Silvera's talk about neural coding. And the reason I'm interested in this idea of efficient coding is it could give us a reason for context dependence of this degree of precision of people's <laughs> responses to uh, the distribution of decision problems that they're faced with at different points um, in the experiment, in these different uh, experimental treatments of Friedman and Jen. So the idea of a, an efficient coding theory is that um, the internal representation R is going to be noisy, conditional on the true characteristics presented to the decision maker. And one wants to endogenize that to consider different possible stochastic relationships between the internal representation and the, the external reality. And one way of constraining the set of possibilities that's often used in this literature is to suppose that the internal representation has to be the output of some kind of noisy communication channel. So this is the value, say, retrieved uh, when you're going to use it as an input to some decision circuit. And the, what's retrieved has to be the outcome, uh, the output of a communication <coughs> channel, which we can model abstractly, as Claude Shannon did, uh, by a set of conditional probabilities. So for any input, um, and I'm sorry, there's a typo here also, um, the conditional probabilities are conditional on the input states M. So there's going to be uh, different pos a set of possible input states to the channel, conditional on the input state. There's a conditional distribution of output states of the channel. That's the thing I'm calling the the bold face R, that is going to be given, but the mapping between external reality and to the input states of the channel can now be endogenized. So we're going to suppose the properties of the channel are fixed. Some biophysical constraints um, result in having to uh, send the message through that channel. The encoding rule that maps the external situation, an element of this set calligraphic X, to a particular input state, an element of the calligraphic M, um, is going to be allowed to be optimally adapted to some prior distribution over decision situations, in addition to having the decoding rule uh, that takes the output of the channel and draws inferences about what the situation is and hence what the, what the desirable action is. So we're going to suppose <coughs> that both of those things can be optimally adapted uh, to the distribution over possible decision problems. So first, what do I have in mind when I hypothesize that the internal representation might have to go through uh, a noisy channel of this form? Uh, one example, this is a sort of a toy example, but a simple idea would be suppose this quantity, some quantity x, is being encoded in the brain by the firing rate of some population of neurons. And in my earlier lecture, I, I showed some data from a study of Camilo Padoasquilpa, where he concludes that the amount of juice being offered to a monkey in a decision problem uh, is being internally represented by certain cells in the orbital frontal cortex um, of, of the monkey's brain, uh, which fire at a faster rate when a larger quantity of juice is, is uh, being offered on that particular trial. And suppose that um, the nature of this representation is that there's going to be some Poisson rate at which uh, neurons in this population are producing spikes. And suppose further there's a biophysical constraint that the rate of spike production can't be, can't be negative, and on the other hand, it can't be larger than some upper bound. And so what we saw in the data I showed uh, earlier from uh, Pato Escilpa's paper was that in different 
uh, blocks of experimental trials where the range of quantities of juice being offered were different on, uh, in, in different uh, experimental treatments, there were changes in the way a given quantity of juice mapped into a rate of spiking, but in all of those cases, uh, there was never a quantity of juice uh, that resulted in more than about nine spikes per second. And on the other hand, it was the case under these different treatments that a high enough quantity of juice did result in spiking at least on the order of, say, eight, eight spikes per second or more. Okay, so if we suppose there is some mapping of that kind of the qu quantity in the decision problem into a rate of spiking of this population of neurons and that the available internal data for making a decision is not the spiking rate itself, but the number of spikes that are produced and then fed into some downstream circuit over a finite uh, time interval, say of length tau, then the, uh, the internal representation is going to be some number of spikes. Uh, in this example, the set of possible inputs to the channel is this interval between zero and m bar, the biophysically uh, possible rates of spiking. Uh, the pro conditional probability of R conditional on X is a Poisson distribution, the total number of spikes observed over the time interval of length tau. The rate parameter of that Poisson distribution is m of x times tau, so it'll be different for different values of x. Okay, and so that's an example of a channel in Shannon's sense because we're going to have a conditional distribution over R uh, conditional on the input m of x. It's always the same as a function of m of x. We can leave free then what the mapping of external reality, the value of x, might be to the m of x, and indeed that was apparently changing under different experimental circumstances in Pato Escilpa's experiment. Okay, so now I want to pose an efficient coding problem. Supposing I have some channel like that, the efficient coding problem would be to choose the m of x function. It's going to map this vector of characteristics of the decision problem into an input to the channel, m of x. I'm going to also choose the decision rule. A of r is going to choose an action from the set of presented actions as a function of the R, the output of the channel, those will both be chosen to maximize uh, some expected utility where utility is defined over the action on the one hand and the true vector of characteristics. And uh, to define that expected value, we're going to take an expectation over a joint distribution for X and R implied on the one hand by the prior distribution over what the decision problems are that are going to be presented to the subject in the environment for which their decision process has been optimally adapted. And then the rest of the joint distribution is determined by this conditional distribution for R conditional on M of X. So the the encoding function of m of x together with the properties of the channel are going to define then the rest of that joint distribution. Okay, so I can define an efficient coding problem like that. To give you a, a simple result about how changing the prior can change the nature of the optimal um, predicted probabilities of action choices, I want to consider a simple example where I look at a family of different priors uh, that differ only in the value of this parameter lambda. So suppose that the prior density function over uh, vectors x for a given value of lambda uh, is of this particular form where pi bar uh, is, a, is a, the probability density function for some particular, some particular probability distribution is a probability de density function for what I'm calling a normalized state vector. So take the vector x relative to some reference vector, x naught, multiply it by lambda. That's my normalized state vector, x tilde. And all of these different priors correspond to the same probability distribution over the normalized state vector, but for different values of the parameter lambda. If you ask, why am I thinking of a case like that? The two treatments of Friedman and Jan are exactly uh, differ from each other in this way. They correspond to uh, lambda being twice as big for one of them as for the other one. They are in fact two members of a family like this. Suppose also that in my decision problem um, my utility function is linear in this vector 
uh, X, and if you ask why, that's also at least a possible understanding of what's going on in the Friedman and Jan uh, problem. Suppose that um, the problem is a choice between lotteries. Uh, the elements of the vector boldface X are payoffs of the different lotteries in different possible states. The, suppose the probabilities are the same across all the trials, which is true of the Friedman and Jan experiment. It's a probability distribution over different decision problems, but they always involved the same probabilities. It was only the X and the C that were different on different trials. And um, suppose the relevant reward here, this U of A and X, is just the expected payoff from the lottery um, that you choose, then in that case, the expected reward would have that linear form shown at the top of the slide. The x naught sub 0 is a vector of payoffs that makes the expected value of the risky lottery and the certain amount equal. And in fact, in the Friedman and Jen experiment, the, uh, the two treatments that they were interested in involved probability distributions for x and c that were uh, that did satisfy the property that I'm assuming here with x naught 0 being the same thing. OK, so if I consider this one parameter family of decision problems with different values of that lambda, one can give a simple result for what the optimal solution is like. The, um, the optimal encoding function will be the thing written on the slide here as a function of lambda, where this m bar is just a function of the normalized um, state vector, the normalized value of, of boldface x. And, um, and the optimal action, A bar of R, uh, depends on R in the same way, independently of the value of lambda. And that M bar and A bar functions are the functions that solve this decision problem written here in terms of the normalized state variable. So there's some solution functions for that problem. And once I solve that problem, I know what the solution to the other problem is for each value of lambda. So what's that going to imply? That's going to imply that the choice frequencies, if I want to ask what's the probability of, say, picking the risky lottery rather than the certain amount, as a function of the objective data, boldface x, that is going to change with lambda. It's going to change with lambda because the mapping of the objective data into the normalized vector, x tilde, is going to vary with lambda. And that's going to tell you exactly um, how the choice probabilities are going to change. Specifically, as we change the value of lambda, the size of the differences in objective payoffs required to get the probability of picking the risky lottery to go from 0.5 to 0.6 or from 0.6 to 0.7, the scale of change in dollar or cent payoffs needed to do that is going to scale with 1 over lambda. So making lambda larger is going to make those, those differences correspondingly smaller, and vice versa. And that's exactly um, what is needed to explain uh, the data of Friedman and Jen. So they double lambda, and they show that when lambda is twice as big, the change in the size of px minus c required to uh, produce a given change in the probability of taking the risky lottery is changed by about exactly that amount. And that's indeed the explanation they propose in their paper is that efficient coding in this sense uh, can explain the difference in behavior in the two treatments. OK, so that is not, however, the end of the talk either. Um, I, I want to point out that there's a problem with that kind of theory. Um, and that is that we observe context dependence similar to what Friedman and Jin found, also in cases where the efficient coding theory that I just went through would not predict that there should be any effect in changing the variability of the outcome. So there's a more recent paper by also by Kerry Friedman with a different co-author, Salvo Nunari, where they look experimentally at uh, people playing a coordination game, a game between two players uh, with a payoff matrix of the kind uh, here. 
Uh, this is a game where the payoff you get if you choose to stay depends on whether the other player leaves or stays. They get a big higher payoff if they also stay. If you leave, you get a payoff independent of what the other person does. And the other thing to notice here is that the payoff you get if you leave is called theta because it's different on different trials. So the 47 and 63 are the same on all the trials. They're going to draw theta from a probability distribution independently on each trial, and it'll be a different number. On each trial, they see what the subjects do when they're randomly paired with other subjects. Uh, but they get to observe what they do on a bunch of games of this kind. and. The distribution of the thetas is a Gaussian distribution with a parameter omega squared in it. Why is that a Greek letter? Because they have two different treatments where that omega squared is also different, a low volatility and a high volatility treatment, and they look about what, at whether behavior is the same. Okay, so what do you expect? You notice here that if um, you're just asking what the Nash equilibria are, assuming you can respond correctly to the payoffs, um, it's going to be optimal to leave uh, if the other is expected to leave, also to stay if the other is expected to stay in the cases where theta is in this intermediate range between 47 and 63. You can get a unique equilibrium using a global games refinement, and it's that both should stay if theta is below 55, both should leave if theta is above 55. There should be a discontinuous change in the probability of staying as theta passes through the value 55. That's not what they see, okay? So I will I'll show you the data in a moment, but I'll just tell you that what they see in the experiment is that behavior, uh, the probability of changing, of staying or leaving, changes more gradually as theta varies. Okay, and well then that's kind of like what I showed you in the lottery choice case where you didn't go discontinuously from taking the risky lottery to not taking the risky lottery. Instead, it varied gradually. OK, and you say, um, so what we need is to get some noise in the decision process. Let's ask if, again, we can explain the nature of the uh, randomness in players' choices conditional on theta and the way that's going to change depending on the distribution of values of theta on different trials through this hypothesis again that the decision has to be based on the outcome of a noisy channel and we can optimize the encoding function uh, uh, in the way that I described before. So we can suppose that there's going to be an encoding function that maps the true value of theta into M, the input to our noisy channel. Uh, you're going to get a random outcome from the noisy channel. The action will have to be a function of that outcome. And we're going to optimize for each player, m of theta and a of r. And we can um, look for a Nash equilibrium of this game in decision rules, meaning the m of theta and the a of r for one player will be a best response to the m of theta and a of r of the other player. And we can even ask for a global games refinement of that and ask what the equilibrium should be. And um, uh, as you might already see, uh, under pretty weak conditions, what this equilibrium is going to be like is it's going to involve each player's encoding function only using two different possible inputs to the noisy channel. So what's going to happen is that given the encoding function and the response rule of the other player, that's going to determine the probability that the other player stays or leaves for each value of theta. It's going to turn out that there's a set of values of theta for which it's best for you to stay and another set for which it's best for you to leave. And for all the theta in one set, you're going to want to choose to the input to the noisy channel to be the one that's going to make it as probable as possible that you will choose to leave. And the other case, you're going to use the input that's going to make it as probable as possible that you're going to choose to stay. And so you're going to end up using only two possible inputs, the two possible inputs being the ones that have the highest probability of being distinguished from each other so that you're going to be able to, in fact, reconstruct from the value of the output of the channel whether you considered it a high case or, or a low case. And so now the prediction 
um, is going to be that the probability of staying or leaving is only going to depend on whether theta was in one of those sets or the other. And so what you're going to see is it's not going to jump discontinuously between 0 and 1, because it, the choice is going to be noisy, but you should see a uh, piecewise constant probability of staying and leaving and a discontinuous change at some value theta star. In uh, the Friedman and Nunari game, in both of their treatments, there's actually a symmetry such that the optimal theta star under the global games refinement is the same value. It's going to be 55 under both treatments. So then you should see exactly the same. Not only should you see a piecewise constant relationship, but exactly the same one regardless of the variability of the thetas. Okay, and now finally here's the data. Is it piecewise constant? No, it's gradually declining as you increase the theta, but it's also not the same function independently of the volatility of the distribution from which the thetas are drawn. Okay, so that theory is also um, not uh, succeeding, and so I want to have a few minutes to suggest what I think might be uh, a more successful way of understanding what's going on. So we can think of this decision process uh, that's going to involve noise somewhere is involving three stages. First, there's the recognition of the situation that's going to produce an internal representation drawn from conditional probabilities that depend on the external situation. A second stage is going to be interpretation of the internal state that's going to associate an internal representation with some distribution over possible external states, which we were assuming was Bayesian, the correct Bayesian posterior, uh, for example, in the uh, efficient coding analysis I just went through. And then finally, action selection based on those beliefs about what the possible values of boldface x must be given your internal representation. So you'll choose an action based on that, uh, that interpretation of the internal states. One might imagine you, uh, you say you sample from that posterior in order to determine what a, uh, what, what a good action is. So in the first class of models that I discussed, there was perfect precision in stages one and two. Uh, the randomness came in because there was a limit to precision at stage three. Um, the second class of models instead assumed that there was perfect precision in both stages two and three. Given the noisy internal representation, the interpretation was Bayes optimal, the action selection was optimal uh, expected reward maximization, the noise um, that couldn't be avoided was in the first stage of the problem. Uh, neither of those got us what we wanted in all cases, so what if we instead assume that there are limits to the precision of the inference uh, in stage two? We don't assume that you have to be basing the decision on the exact Bayesian posterior as the interpretation of the noisy internal state. Why might I assume that there's some limits to the precision there. Well, assuming that people should have access to the correct Bayesian posterior, no matter what the noisy uh, internal representation is like, requires that they should know with perfect precision something that, in fact, we can't expect them to be able to learn precisely from some finite body of experience uh, because they have to know the correct prior uh, as well as the, the correct likelihood of the, of the internal representations to necessarily know what that correct Bayesian posterior is. If we think the mapping from internal states to interpretations is something that's going to have to be learned from experience, then I think it makes more sense to suppose that people might have learned to choose a model that's a good model from within some finitely parameterized family of possible models, but not necessarily the correct statistical model. So then, in general, we should expect an incorrect model to be learned, even with a lot of experience. Uh, this is like, say, in the proposal of uh, Burke-Nash equilibrium as a, as a weakening of the assumptions of Nash equilibrium in um, uh, games with imperfect information. I want to weaken the assumption that people know the correct Bayesian posterior in a similar way here. <coughs> 
The specific structure that I want to propose using uh, is the architecture of a variational autoencoder from the machine learning literature. This is something that Jakob uh, Steiner has already introduced in, uh, in his lecture for people in the summer school. Uh, Noga Zaslavsky was also talking a bit about these things um, earlier today. This is an architecture that has uh, two statistical models in it. There's an encoder that takes the external data x, uh, represents it by some latent <coughs> state z, so there's a set of conditional probabilities that determine the probability of a given latent state being assigned to the external situation. The latent state can then be decoded through a second statistical model that can supply uh, values of x, reconstructed values of x, that are drawn from a probability distribution conditional on the latent state and that can be used then to, uh, to interpret. So those are the two stages needed in my decision problem. And in the variational autoencoder literature, it's assumed that there's some parametric family of possible encoders, some parametric family of possible decoders, and um, each of them is optimized given the nature of the other one. And what I want to talk about here, it's the fact that the set of possible decoders are going to be a finite parametric family that's going to limit the precision of the inference. Uh, I'm going to let, in fact, the encoder be the optimal encoder in an unrestricted way given the nature of the decoder that's learned. And so it's going to make it clear it's not limits to the precision of the encoding that are actually going to be um, the problem here. Okay, so each of the two models will be used to train the other one in the sense that the parameters of each model are adjusted to be optimal given uh, the other model. What does that mean? In the uh, classic variational autoencoder setup, what's assumed is that the parameters of the two models are each being adjusted to minimize this callback Leibler divergence, a measure of the difference between the two joint distributions, the joint distribution of x and z implied by the encoding model and the distribution of x and z implied by the decoding model. Uh, <laughs> What we do in my work with Rava del Silvera and, uh, and Guy Aridor is that we've generalized this by proposing, uh, generalized it in a way to make it useful not just as a way of learning a statistical representation of some distribution of values in some body of experience, but to also have the uh, the system be able to endogenously learn latent states that are useful as a basis for solving some decision problem. So the decision problem is going to involve choosing an action A. There's going to be a specified reward for choosing A when the external state is X. We're going to assume, though, the action has to be chosen on the basis of this latent state Z rather than directly on the basis of X. And um, so we can then define an expected loss from suboptimal action selection given what the specified recognition model is and the specified generative model. And we can now make that also a criterion for training the model. We can suppose that the parameters of the recognition model and the generative model are both going to be optimized, not just to minimize this callback Leibler divergence, but a weighted average of that and the expected loss from suboptimal action selection. And there'll be some relative weight beta on the relative importance of those two um, criteria. And so we're interested in studying the trade-off between the two objectives. So I'm going to show you quickly what happens in a simple example um, of this. So the decision problem is one where there's some feature vector of the situation, boldface x. It has n elements. Those are each measuring one of the attributes of the choice problem. The choice problem is going to be a binary, binary decision, accept or reject some option. The net payoff from accepting is just going to be the average of these different x's. So they're all equally relevant to the decision problem. Uh, the way the variation autoencoder is going to work is each time a decision problem, the vector x is presented, it's going to be labeled with one or another of two possible latent states, one of which will lead you to accept, the other of which will lead you um, to reject. 
And um, the class of possible generative models are going to be ones where conditional on the latent state, the distribution of possible x's that you're going to have to interpret what the latent state means is some multivariate Gaussian distribution. I'm going to let it be any possible multivariate Gaussian distribution, but it has to be multivariate Gaussian. Recognition models can be absolutely anything. Okay, um, we train the variational autoencoder where the x's are drawn from a prior distribution which is also multivariate Gaussian. Okay, and so what do we get for different values of beta? When beta is extremely small, what's going to happen with these, what these ellipsoids are telling you is these are level sets of the probability density function of the two distributions that are used to interpret what z equals 1 and z equals 2 means. And so when beta is very small, these are almost the same distribution. Uh, the dots are the modes of those two probability distributions, which are also their means. Um, and they're close to the origin. If beta goes to 0, they're exactly at the origin. These are exactly the same two distributions. The latent state is completely uninformative about what x is. If beta is small, it's still quite uninformative, although there's a small differentiation. If we make beta bigger, the difference in those two distributions in the generative model gets bigger. If I make beta even bigger, it's even bigger. And the limit as beta goes to infinity, it approaches this. What's this telling us? Well, we learn a generative model which is going to interpret the two latent states as telling you different things, but only in one sense. So these multivariate normal distributions associated with the latent states are the product of a normal distribution in one direction, which is the direction of the ray along which all the x's are equal, and another multivariate normal distribution um, in directions orthogonal to that, which is the same for both distributions. So in fact, the latent state is being interpreted as telling you only about differences in one direction, the direction given by that ray, uh, or the direction in which the average of the x's or the sum of the x's is increasing, which is the thing that's welfare relevant. So you're learning uh, a generative model which is providing you partial information about a specific aspect of the data which is, uh, which is relevant to decision. The recognition model, this is a heat map showing you the probability of assigning the state latent state 2 as opposed to latent state 1 as a function of two of the dimensions here of x. When beta is close to 0, this is essentially flat. It's almost equal probability uh, everywhere. As beta gets bigger, uh, you start differentiating the probability of classifying it as uh, latent state 2 or latent state 1 more sharply. Uh, what you notice here is that the probability of being classified as latent state 2 only depends on the, uh, the value of the sum or average of the different x's in the other direction. The classification probability is independent of the x's. As I make beta larger, this gets sharper. And in the limit, as beta goes to infinity, it's perfectly deterministic classification leading to perfectly optimal choice. And so there's the trade-off between the values you can achieve for the two different objectives. So this provides an interpretation of randomness of choice. It's not because the randomness uh, is inevitable. I can drive the randomness to 0, which is that extreme where L is equal to 0 down at the lower right. That's perfectly deterministic choice, so it is assumed to be feasible. But that's a high value of this DKL, this, uh, this discrepancy, uh, inaccuracy of the interpretation provided by the generative model. And I can reduce that DKL quite a lot with even a little bit of, of additional randomness. And uh, so assuming you put some weight on both objectives, you're not going to be anywhere close to being out at that extreme. You will have a, a non-trivial amount of randomness in the classifications and hence in the actions. OK, so the thing I'm interested in is what if I change the dispersion of the x's? So I'm going to do an example where now I'm going to double the standard deviation of each of the components of x. This is a figure I showed you before. Um, this is the same figure, keeping the same value of beta, but doubling the standard deviation of each of the x's. And so now these two distributions have to be much more spread out because we want the generative model to match fairly well 
uh, the joint distribution implied by the recognition model, and that involves this wider range of x's. Okay, so it's forcing us to go to that. If we ask what the probabilities of choice now look like in the two environments, we get uh, a curve like this for the probability of accepting as a function of the uh, true value of accepting relative to rejecting, which is x bar on the horizontal axis, and they are indeed different in the two environments, uh, similar to the difference in the two environments that Friedman and Nunari find. Uh, so I think I'm out of time, but um, what I would like to suggest is that this is a way of thinking not just about the reason for randomness in choice, but the way it might be expected to endogenously vary across distributions of choice problems that can explain um, the Friedman and not just the Friedman and Jin case here, but can also explain Friedman and Nunari. So I don't have time to show you, but if you read our uh, our working paper, our recent working paper, it does analyze the coordination game using this same setup and shows that we can explain why also in the coordination game case we get gradual changes in the choice probabilities like this and get them changing with the degree of volatility of the class of problems in the way that um, uh, Friedman and Nunari propose. So in terms of you know, the big lesson from this, I'd like to suggest that thinking about models where there are limits to the precision of the interpretation of noisy internal states uh, may be important, assuming that people have to learn how to interpret their noisy internal states, but using misspecified models um, is important for understanding not just biases that we might observe in choice, but also the nature of the variability of responses and how that variability um, varies endogenously across environments. Finally, as a, as a big lesson from it, I hope to convince you that there are things that economic modelers can learn from uh, looking into the machine learning literature, which I think we've found um, um, uh, very stimulating for us, and hopefully some of the students here will also want to get further into. I know Jacob is already Jacob is already convinced, but uh, I hope more of you will also think there's something interesting here. Thanks. Well, I mean, it, at least in you know these simple environments, we can use the model and produce quantitative predictions about how changing the distribution of environments should change things. I think the question is how it should be extended to more complex um, kinds of choice problems, um, and you know we want we want to do that, but we haven't gotten very far into it yet. Well, there were those two terms in the objective function, right? And it, so it's because of the presence of the first term that, that, you, that you care about congruence between the generative model and the joint distribution implied by the encoding model in addition to caring about having internal representation that leads you to make act ac accurate choices. And so in this setup, the way to do better on that first criterion is to make sure that your generative model uh, spreads out the distributions associated with the different, um, the different latent states to a degree that's similar to the joint distribution of uh, 
external situations and latent states in the environment. So when the environment involves a bigger range of external states, the corresponding distributions associated with the latent state by the decoder have to spread out to a similar extent. Otherwise, you're not going to be doing well on that, on that congruence measure. And it's the fact that you care about that, but that it's also not just obvious that you can reduce that to zero independently of what the um, encoder is like that then produces this tension. So the generative model has some wider predictions, much in line with there being a high volatility environment. Yes. But the action is chosen to maximize the expected utility. Yes. Given, given the interpretation, so given the distribution of x values associated with implied by the generative model. It's not entirely clear that just because the probability distribution of outcomes is, 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 is has high variance, the expected utility is going to... Respond. Well, the, the optimal encoder, the recognition model, is going to have to more gradually change the, the probability of encoding something as latent state 2 instead of latent state 1 with the variations in x, again, in order to make that callback Leibler divergence small. So it, it, we're assuming it's feasible to have an encoding function that sharply differentiates whether the average value of x is positive or negative, but that would lead to a joint distribution of latent states and external states which is going to look less like the joint distribution implied by the generative model. Because the generative model has these distributions that are very spread out and overlap a lot with each other. Oh, it doesn't have to be a known in closed form. Indeed, the whole point, I think an attractive feature of this is that it's a way of learning an approximate uh, generative model to interpret the states without having access to know what the true Bayesian posterior is. And uh, I didn't talk about learning algorithms. I just said, well, we want to, uh, you know, adaptation to the environment <coughs> means that those parameters minimize something. but. The machine learning literature is, of course, all about proposing also algorithms um, for uh, iteratively adjusting those parameters given some, um, you know, some set of samples from an environment. So it definitely does not assume you already know. I mean, that's, sort of, that's, that's from the point of view of the, you know, the people working in the machine learning literature, the, how you can estimate those things without someone having already told you uh, what the right distributions are is indeed the big virtue of the of the approach. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you think about an application like the glo the, um, this coordination game, global game application, in the game theoretic standard game theoretic analysis of that problem, we make a big deal out of the fact that the high order beliefs matter, not just the uncertainty about the theta, but also uncertainty about what the other knows about what you did you think about that uh, that actually what you're trying to learn is actually the hierarchy of the beliefs to some extent not just the theta so, so, so in the way we modeled it I mean so we're not modeling a deductive process right we're, we're modeling the outcome of a learning process where each of the players um, is is tuning the parameters of their generative model and recognition model given data that are being generated by the environment, which now includes not just the theta drawn by the experimenter, but the play of the, um, of the other player. So they each have a model of how the latent states are associated with values of theta, therefore game payoffs, but also associated with the, uh, the, the probabilities of play of the other player. So they, they, have, they each have a model, a statistical model of the other player's play, but they are not deriving that from a theoretical calculation of what it would make sense for the other player to do. They're just, you know, they're just modeling the other player as some random variable uh, that's correlated with other random variables, and they're learning, um, you know, they're learning what joint distribution seems to fit the data with no 
you know, no a priori theory about what it should be. So that's why higher order beliefs then don't come into the calculation. So each, they pick both of those functions as a best response to the functions chosen by the other player. And in, in our algorithm, you know, there are parameters of it, and they are being updated again, you know, in, in a mechanical way, given the data that you have. It's less convincing for me because in the laboratory experiments, not only do I have to consciously adjust my encoding strategy in my brain somewhere, uh, so strategically fine-tuning it to find the best response, I can suss out uh, my opponent's messaging uh, strategy as well, which in their head, and it's kind of hard to observe. Um, so here, they're not modeling what's in the head of the opponent, though. They're just modeling the statistical correlation between right. the actions observed on previous rounds. And I see. But do you think that the three subjects can consciously adjust their encoding strategy, encoding functions? Well, so, so this is a model that tries to explain how a type of equilibrium could arise without them having to do any of that kind of reasoning. happens if we run simulations or is that what happens in, uh, in experiments if you get convergence to some kind of I mean that that would that would be an interesting thing to know and I don't know that Friedman and Nunari report that they can see the learning but you would think that there should be some adjustment I mean at least relative to the first few times first few trials and later trials in the experiment, you would expect the adjustment to be occurring. Um, we, since it's their experiment and not ours, we haven't had an opportunity to try to look for that ourselves. Yeah. We, we assume that you know, one of the terms in our objective that the circuits are being tuned to optimize is expected reward. So it's not assuming, uh, indeed that's the big change in what we're doing relative to most of the literature that uses variations of variational autoencoders is that they assume pure <coughs> informativeness uh, in some sense of the internal states is the only criterion for learning them and we're putting in this weight on you know, what economists are used to thinking yeah. determines behavior, namely average rewards people get from their behavior and we're putting that in as another term. It's just that there is this information theoretic term also of wanting to learn a model of the environment that is congruent with I mean, even the version of efficient coding that I presented had that characteristic as well, which again, a lot of the efficient coding literature in the neuroscience literature often assumes you're just maximizing the informativeness of the information in the neural uh, responses. We were defining, I was you know, showing you an efficient coding problem where it was assumed that what you want to maximize subject to the constraint was expected reward of the decision maker. So. Uh, so I'm completely on board that one should not just assume that purely information theoretic concerns should determine the structure of the internal representations. Yeah. The way you did efficient coding is that you have a fixed channel and then you're just optimizing the, the encoding function, right. 
Well, of course, you could, but I mean, often, often the literature assumes a channel. So in Rava's talk, I mean, he did a much more complicated version of that and more realistic version of it than what I presented. But if you remember, the model he spent the most time on was one where <coughs> there was an encoding function. It was called Xi. You, you took the value of the stimulus magnitude, and there was a nonlinear function Xi of that stimulus. And then the outcome was you got a complicated pattern of neural responses that depended on the value of that Xi, that, or that Xi of x function, and then a given x. Uh, that function was mapping stimulus magnitudes to which neurons. There were neurons located on a line, and it was determining which of them were the ones whose preferred stimulus was that particular thing in the world. That's what the C of x function was determining. It had exactly this form. It was a more complicated channel, but it was, again, a given channel. Given conditional on C, the probability distribution over uh, spiking rates of all the different neurons. Um, you know, it was just a function of that Xi, and then it was saying Xi as a function of external characteristics of the stimuli could be completely endogenized. So, I mean, that was also an example of what I was doing. But I don't, I don't want to insist that as a matter of definition, I mean, you know, you have to do it this way. But I think this is classically, when people talk about efficient coding, if you ask why do they use that word, it's because if it means this, you know, it's taking as given a channel and asking what's the optimal code to use to take the situations in the world and uh, encode it in a way that it can be run through the channel. So then it maps into a classic problem in communications engineering. But as a matter of theory, you could have optimized the channel. You, you could imagine theories that optimize the channel. Rational inattention, right. for so example, is you know such a theory. Theory. Yeah, we, in our paper, I'll refer you to the working paper where we discuss rational inattention and why it does not explain uh, the experimental data either. But yeah. And it, it's the same as my first theory, actually, because there's a symmetry in the Friedman and Nunari experiment um, so that it's going to be optimal for the unconditional probabilities of choosing the two responses to be equal. <coughs> And given that, uh, maximizing expected payoff subject to um, a, a, multi, you know, a, a penalty, a linear penalty on mutual information is equivalent to a linear penalty on the entropy of, uh, of your responses. So in fact, it, it fails for the same reason as my first theory. Well, in the exercise I went through, there was no restriction on the class of recognition functions. Now, of course, you might think that realistically there should be a restriction, and, but I was showing you what you could get even without any such restriction. And um, the point of that was to show you that the restricted family of generative models seems to us more essential to the kind of results that we were getting there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, we would be happy if it turned out that you could observe them and measure them, right? That would, be, that would be relevant to saying the theory is on the right track. I will not claim that I already know how to show you where they are and that, you know, that you can measure them. I mean, it, it assumes some class of structures rather than assuming uh, some relatively abstract axioms on what, um, on what the structures might be like. That's right. I mean, um, I'm, um, you know, someone may eventually, if, if the model turns out to seem to be the right kind of model, then maybe uh, someone will find a way of generalizing it and making it look more axiomatic. I mean, 
we're, we're starting by studying a particular kind of structure and seeing that it allows things to be endogenized, that it seems to be useful to endogenize. Uh, but, you know, I like some papers, a lot of yours, that, you know, proceed this way, right? I mean, <laughs> what? You wanted me to give a speech against axioms? What did you want? <laughs> I suspect that what you were asking about was the constraints on the family of possible generative models, and you would like some more axiomatic um, characterization of what the possible generative models are. And uh, I mean, uh, again, I'm I'm not against that if I know what the, uh, the, what the right set of axioms are that deliver the kind of structure that. Um, that makes sense is, I think assuming that it's restricted instead of just assuming that um, both that it could be an infinitely flexible class of statistical models and you will, surely people will learn the right one, you know, exactly the best one. I mean, that seems like a heroic assumption. And so then the question is, so what, within what more restricted class does learning um, can I, occur? Can I rephrase yeah. Jacob's question a little bit differently? Yeah. As you said, you were assuming And that was important. Exactly. So I'm trying to kind of try to understand where you're standing on that. The rational intention approach assumes this kind of flexibility up to a constraint, but, but huge flexibility, uh, what they call richness. Right. So where do you stand on that? Do you think of that distinction as a big deal or, you know, two shades of essentially the same kind of model? Do you think that distinction is a big deal or not? I think that the fact that those models assume exact Bayesian decoding um, as being, you know, again, in the absence of any constraints, it's obviously optimal. Um, I think introducing a constraint on the precision of the interpretation of, uh, of the signals um, may be important, and important, say, to explain the kind of phenomena that I was that I was looking at here. Um, I'm not sure I have something something deeper to say about, um, you know, this was sort of an illustration. This was an illustration of what it would mean to introduce a constraint, but not just hard wiring saying the interpretation has to be this. I was allowing the system to learn any multivariate Gaussian distributions as the possible interpretations of the latent states and so then um, you know the kind of multivariate Gaussian distributions that end up being associated with the latent state is endogenized the fact that it wasn't allowed to be something more flexible was what resulted in that trade-off that I wouldn't say we have a you know a some, something in particular to say about that yet. And I think you could have many other restricted families as long as they're not extremely flexible that would still give you a trade-off like this. I mean, this is the particular trade-off that you get if it's, if it's the family of multivariate Gaussian functions. Um, you know, multivariate Gaussian distributions are used a lot in the machine learning literature that we're referring to, but that's not a proof that it's, there's something um, um, I mean, it makes the, the learning simple. I mean, that's one advantage if you ask, you know, how do you um, figure out what the optimal 
parameters of those multivariate Gaussian distributions are, given a sample of experience that's been labeled by latent states, the answer is I can write very simple algorithms for you to compute the optimal parameters. I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that why we, in classrooms, we love, you know, doing things with, with normal distributions. They have lots of nice properties that are convenient for solving those kinds so of problems. Perhaps, but again, I, I won't say we have a deep theory of it yet to, uh, to answer that. 